My name is Olivia. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I am about to apply to anesthesia for residency this year. So pray for me. <laughs> um, and today we're going to be doing a dermatology topic on rashes and lesions. I've had a couple requests for derm in the past, and I was waiting until I'd done my dermatology rotation, which I just did a couple of weeks ago. So I could like actually know what I'm talking about somewhat. So I think this will be interesting. Derm is like a huge thing in primary care. Um, and also it's a pretty desirable specialty for a lot of people. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. So we're going to start with our patient case and go through their physical exam and their differential diagnosis. Together, we'll kind of come up with our assessment and plan, and then we will spend some time learning about the pathology of disease. So please participate. It looks like we've got a pretty small group today. Like last I checked, it was just like six people. So if we get some more, that'd be great. But this is really an awesome chance for you guys to like interact and ask questions. Um, and really, we can just make it what you want. So if there's any time that you want to speed up or slow down or go back, then just let me know. And then if you are, if this is your first time, we always have like a soap note to fill out through the presentation, um, which is like really low pressure. It's like just to help you kind of follow along. And then after the presentation, there's a 10 question quiz, but I'm really chill about it. And I just want you guys to like be able to apply what you learned. So if there's any slides that you want to go back to for like helping with the questions, then we can do that at the end as well. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so we're gonna start with our case. We have a 38 year old female who presents to clinic with a chief complaint of a rash on her arms. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, just off the bat, you can see that this is kind of like a red, shiny kind of scaly looking rash that has like these kind of smaller little circles that kind of fuse together. Um, so in dermatology, it's really important to be able to describe and characterize the rash. And we'll be able to do that um, later on in the presentation once we talk about the terminology a little bit more, but just kind of keep this picture in your mind. Our patient says that this rash started a few weeks ago and has just gradually gotten worse. Um, these like little smaller circles have fused together um, and just gotten overall bigger. She does say that this is mildly itchy. So it is bothering her, um, but she's also just really um, concerned about just the way that it looks and how, you know, it's the summer and she wants to be able to wear shorts and tank tops and that she feels embarrassed by this rash. So it's mostly on her elbows, shoulders, knees, and some also involvement of her scalp. Um, for the review of systems, she has noticed that her joints have been a little bit achy, um, but you know, it could be a lot of things. Also, she says that her nails seem bumpy, um, which is something new for her. She's never noticed before. And she's um, not having any like fevers or weight loss, GI changes or any neuro problems. So it's just, it's just this rash and then the joints and the nails. So for her past medical history, she has a history of hypothyroidism um, and also had chickenpox or varicella virus at the age of six. Um, so for her medication, she takes levothyroxine. Levothyroxine is like a synthetic thyroid replacement drug. So anyone who has hypothyroidism likely is taking levothyroxine. She also takes docusate for constipation as needed and has a Nexplanon birth control implant. So that's the little thing that it looks like a matchstick. And they kind of put it like in your, under the skin of your arm and it lasts for, um, I think it's like a few years and it just kind of releases progesterone slowly over time. Um, for her family history, her father has a history of high cholesterol and her sister has a history of atopic dermatitis, which is more commonly known as eczema. And she also has type one diabetes. So maybe some like autoimmune picture going on with her personal history of hypothyroidism and her sister with type one diabetes. Um, and then also to keep in mind that this, you know, could, we should still consider eczema or this atopic dermatitis based on her family history of it as well. And then for social history, she also just started a new job at a nursing home. So in places where we have like a large population dwelling in the same location, 
um, it's always good to consider like an infectious ideology as well. So here's her physical exam. Um, her vitals, does anyone wanna to try to interpret her vitals for me? Like, does anything look abnormal or do they look like pretty normal? Sammy's saying slightly high blood pressure. Yeah, I would agree with that. Our normal range for blood pressure would be below um, 120 over 80. Um, as a 38 year old female, like she is kind of starting to get up to the age that we see people developing hypertension. And so we would actually consider her hypertensive if she was like 130 systolic blood pressure. Um, so yeah, it's just like something to keep an eye on for her like general health maintenance that we'd want to make sure that she is um, practicing good health habits and to try to keep her blood pressure down with like lifestyle changes, um, before escalating to medication. Um, and then Diana said respiratory is a little bit low. Um, it could be certainly depending on what her baseline is. Um, overall though, I think that like these vitals are not concerning for like any red flag. Um, and there is some variation like person to person. So even though, you know, she's a little bit high, on the blood pressure and she could have like a lower respiratory rate right now um that i'm not like super concerned about like her being in any sort of life-threatening state and then for her physical exam her general she just you know is appearing like her normal self no distress um cardiovascular and respiratory are both unremarkable um regular rate and rhythm and then she has equal lung sounds and then for her skin exam, this is where we kind of care about it, especially in Durham. They just do very focused skin exams. Um, and so this is where the terminology kind of becomes very important because the way that we describe the rash or the lesion, um, we want to be able to like paint a picture for whoever is reading the note um, so that they can kind of imagine what it looks like as well. And then of course, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we also try to document with photos in the chart so that people can actually see what we see or what we were seeing and then be able to track it through time. But for purposes of the note, we see several round coalescing, well demarcated erythematous plaques um, with overlying silver scale on the extensor surfaces. So to break that down a little bit, you know, we're seeing these sort of like smaller, rounder, um, components to the rash that are kind of fusing together or coalescing. And then well demarcated is meaning that like the rash has clear borders of where it starts and ends. Like the normal skin kind of goes right up to the border of the rash. And then you can tell clearly that it's abnormal there versus if it was not well demarcated, then it might be like more kind of like slowly fading into the normal skin. And then erythematous is just the fancy derm word for red. <laughs> Um, so it's just saying that like the skin underlying it is red. Um, we'll go over what plaques are in a little bit and like what makes that different from other types of skin lesions. Um, and then also the overlying silver scale, um, that's just kind of showing that like it had that, um, that extra like kind of peeling and shiny looking skin that's sitting on top of the rash, um, and be, and also with it being on her extensor surfaces. So that'd be on like the backs of your elbows or like the tops of your knees um, in, in contrast with a flexor surface, which would be like the insides of your wrist, the insides of your elbow and like the, the back of your knee. So um, that's also a good way to distinguish between the eczema and other things like that we'll talk about in a couple of slides that eczema tends to be more on your flexor surfaces like your creases. And then like, for example, psoriasis can be on your extensor surfaces. And then the last part of it with um, the nails having this like irregular pitting, um, that that's another like important thing to note, like the nails are part of the skin um, and the hair is like another part of like a dermatologic exam that we'd want to have documented. Um, so we'll show you guys some pictures of what this looks like in a second. So this is a picture or some pictures of our patient's rash and her physical exam findings. So um, again, like 
this rash photo is a little bit different than what we showed at the beginning, but it has a lot of the same characteristics of it. So we see this, like, this is what I'm saying, like the well demarcated where like her skin is totally like normal around here. And then all of a sudden it just turns into this rash and it's like the sort of red, pink, um, like fused together circles that um, have this sort of white or silvery, like overlying flaking or dryness that's sitting on top of it. Um, and then this nail pitting here, you can kind of see like where the light reflects off that it just has these little, um, like if you guys were like me in elementary school and had those like um, pink pencil erasers, you would stab holes in when you're bored. Like it kind of looks like that. And then also showing that it just had scalp involvement as well. So it kind of is going along this posterior hairline down around the ear and then even a little bit onto the neck. It has those sort of smaller circles um, that are still separated, but you can see that they'd like fused together up here. So um, really important to do a thorough exam in derm, um, even if the patient was just coming in about complaints on her elbows and shoulders, like we still um, wanted to look at her hair and her nails as well. So with seeing this exam and some of the things that we've talked about, what kind of skin conditions would you guys want to have on your differential diagnosis? I'll challenge you to try to like come up with at least two or even more than that if possible. Mark said psoriasis. Excellent. There's another type of rash and skin condition we mentioned earlier that I think would still be good to consider for her. Eczema, yeah, exactly. Especially with that family history of eczema. Um, after doing our exam, like I would say that it's less likely that it's eczema, but like we still wanted to include it on our differential because sometimes things don't always present the way that they are in a textbook. Okay, great. Yeah, you guys are completely on the right track. So I came up with a couple of options that I think would be a good differential for this type of rash and the findings that we saw. So Mark said psoriasis, which is at the top of my differential as well. Psoriasis is kind of defined as like these scaly plaques of the extensor surfaces. You'll see like when you are in med school and like taking board questions and things like that, that's kind of the classic way that they'll describe it. Um, and so like she kind of fits that picture with what we were seeing on her exam. Another thing that can mimic that is things called tinea. So tinea is the like name for a fungal infection of the skin. And you can have tinea pedis, tinea capitis, tinea caporis, um, like all the different areas of your body having a different like second part of the name after tinea. But essentially they're all caused by like fungal infections. So tinea corporis is also known as ringworm commonly. It's not, ringworm is not like a parasite or a worm. It's it's just a fungus, but it makes like a circle um, with kind of that similar like scaly appearance on the circle that can mimic psoriasis. Um, and also being that she just started in a nursing home, there's like a higher risk that she could have been exposed to like fungus or like if she's potentially like helping people like with bathing and things like that. Um, just another thing to keep in mind. And then we did mention atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, this is like that redness and bumps of the flexural surfaces that I had talked about earlier, kind of like your creases. So a little bit less likely that she's, she's having it on the extensor surfaces, but still something to consider. Um, another thing with it being in her hairline, especially is something called seborrheic dermatitis. And this is an inflammation of the oil glands. So people tend to get this like in on their forehead, on their nose, and then in the folds, like kind of next to your nose and going down to your mouth. Um, they get this sort of like red irritated and peely skin rash. And it can also go into your hairline and cause like a lot of dandruff. So um, I would also consider seborrheic dermatitis for her. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's certainly more things that could cause a rash, <laughs> like literally so many things cause rashes. But this is just the ones that I thought were most consistent with her history and her exam.
So just to kind of show you guys some pictures of what those differential looks like, this is a good example of eczema. Um, you can see this is the back of somebody's knees and it just looks really kind of diffuse. It doesn't have that well demarcated border like we saw on our patient. And it just kind of has this mix of like bumps and redness and a lot of scratch marks and like some scabs even from where people scratch at it. Um, and so this is kind of like classic eczema. So you might see this like on the knees on like a lot of people have it around their hands and their wrists. If they're babies, they can get it on their face. Um, it really like it can go anywhere. Um, and it just looks like this sort of red bumpiness and it's very, very itchy. So that's the difference between like psoriasis can be itchy, but eczema is like classically like extremely itchy and just chronically dry and irritated. This is a picture of seborrheic dermatitis that I was talking about earlier, um, the inflammation of the oil glands. So we see in this patient, like a lot around his forehead, around his eyebrows, it kind of goes up into the hairline as well. Um, again, it's not very well demarcated, but we still see that kind of skin peeling, like dead skin appearance. Um, so that's, yeah, that's seborrheic dermatitis. And this is actually, I forgot to put this on the slide, but just for your own knowledge, this is contributed to by an overgrowth of yeast on the skin. So typically our skin has a ton of um, microbes, including bacteria and yeast that's actually supposed to be there. And it's important for our barrier health, but when there's an imbalance and there's too much yeast overgrowth, then you can get um, this inflammation of the, of the oil glands and cause the seborrheic dermatitis. This is the tinea that I was talking about. This is the fungal infection or ringworm. So like here on the neck, you can see it kind of makes this like circular shape that you would like, you can maybe think that it looks like a worm, but it's not a worm or a parasite. It's just the fungal infection taking that shape. And so when we think of like a circular rash, I always think of tinea first. And there's a way that we'll talk about in a couple of slides of how you can distinguish the two. But this one also, you can see in the middle, it kind of has some area of clearing, like the middle of the ring isn't completely red all the way through. It's just really this border that looks abnormal. Um, and then this is psoriasis. So psoriasis is like many things, a spectrum. Um, it can range from mild, like these just couple of like dry looking patches on the hand to this very, very severe case of plaque psoriasis on the right, where you have like it all over your body and it looks very, very hyper keratotic and really thick, like overlying scale on the skin. Um, so that's like a very severe case of it, but, um, yeah, I just wanted to show you guys like the spectrum of psoriasis and how it can look these different ways. So going back to like how you can distinguish between tinea um, and psoriasis, something that we can do is call a KOH or the potassium hydroxide prep. And that's a little short procedure you can do in the office where you take like a scraping of the, of the skin with the rash on it and you put it on a glass slide and you drop some potassium hydroxide on the sample and look at it under the microscope. And if you see these sort of like branching hyphae of the fungus, then you can confidently like confirm that this is a fungal infection and diagnose it as tinea. Um, if you don't see this, which like, so this is not our patient's sample. Um, hers was negative, but I just wanted to show you guys what it would look like under the microscope. Um, when you do the scraping motion, if you get this like pinpoint bleeding where the scales are coming off and um, like that's where like the capillaries are breaking underneath the skin, that's called a positive auspice sign. And that is um, highly correlated with psoriasis. So bleeding and no um, like hyphae under the KOH prep would be psoriasis. And if they don't have bleeding and they do have high fee under the KOH, then that would be tinea. And then for educational purposes, um, I'll show you guys a biopsy of what psoriasis looks like later on. So you can see microscopically like what the layers of the skin 
and the cells look like and what's actually going on at like a pathologic level that that's pending for right now. So for our assessment and plan, in summary, we have a 38 year old female with a history of hypothyroidism and varicella who presents with a subacute onset, so like a three week onset of a red, scaly, itchy rash on the extensor surfaces and her scalp. And she also has nail pitting. Um, she has a positive auspice sign on exam and a negative KOH prep. So we're gonna say that her rash in history is most consistent with psoriasis. So our plan for this patient is going to be to begin topical corticosteroids, which the drug that we're going to start with is called triamcinolone. Um, and we would also consider immunosuppressive therapy if she does not respond to the topical alone. So I'll kind of go through a little bit later the pharmacology of how that works and the escalation of therapy. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions about our case or about the workup of psoriasis or needed to go back to any slides before we move on. Is this a good pace for everyone? Are we going like too fast or too slow? Perfect. Thank you, Bridget. Okay. Awesome. Well, we will move on then. Um, we're going to start by just kind of going through some normal skin anatomy. Um, so the skin is made up of three layers. You have the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. The epidermis has five sub layers. I don't want you guys to worry about the names of the cells within the epidermis, but just know that all of these cells are um, different types of keratinocytes. So keratinocytes are the cells that um, secrete a protein called keratin. You could probably infer by the name. Um, and the keratin is what forms that like outer protein layer um, on the skin to protect and form a barrier and to make it so that we don't have like water getting in or like have it be open to the world basically. Um, so keratinocytes are very important um, and they kind of go from this basal layer and differentiate upwards. So they get flatter and flatter and flatter, and eventually they will die and be shed um, along with like every other thing on your skin. <laughs> um, so that's the epidermis. And then the dermis is the layer right below it that contains um, a lot of like um, small blood vessels. It has like um, hair follicles and oil glands and sweat glands. Um, and then also like some nerves as well to sense like pressure and touch. And then the hypodermis is this very bottom layer with like fat cells and then larger blood vessels like arterioles and venules that will um, either feed or drain the smaller capillaries that go up into the dermis. So this is what an actual microscopic image looks like. This border here with these little bumps, this is between the epidermis and the dermis. So everything above it is the epidermis. We see this is like that basal layer of cells that kind of starts to go up and flatten out. And then eventually this top kind of lacy looking layer is that keratin protein layer that's actually acellular. And that's just the protein that's secreted by those top keratinocytes. And this like very flat um, looking layer is just um, keratinocytes that are going to be shed off. Um, everything below this here is the dermis, and this is just a ton of connective tissue. You can't really see any like blood vessels or um, nerve um, bundles or fibers in this cross section. Um, and then like way down here would be the hypodermis. And then, so this is where it's important to know the terminology for um, describing skin lesions. And so there's several types of primary skin lesions that I want you guys to know and what their like definitions are. So we're gonna go through these here and then that'll help us be able to describe like our patient's rash. So first we have a macule. A macule is a flat lesion that's less than one centimeter. So these are things like freckles um, or like any, any just like small 
either hyper or hypopigmented area of skin. It can be on the lip or it can be on like the eye or it can be really anywhere in the body. Um, but the key thing here is that it's less than one centimeter and it's flat. So if you were to feel over it, you wouldn't feel anything different than the surrounding tissue. Next, we have a papule. Um, so this is like a macule where it's less than one centimeter, but it's raised. So it's showing this here. It's like a like either a, a small mole or like, I don't even know, like a sebaceous gland hypertrophy or something. Um, but usually just like small moles or like raised freckles would be papules. These can also be um, like acne as well. If it's like um, just like a red bump or something, it doesn't have to be a mole or like a, a growth. It can fluctuate, um, but we'll kind of go through like an acne sometimes if, it, if it's like visibly filled with pus or has purulent, purulent fluid in the inside, then um, it can be defined differently. Um, next we have a patch. So this is the counterpart to a macule, but greater than one centimeter. So that'd be like this kind of flat birthmark looking thing here. Um, and then lastly, up, up, oh my gosh, this is supposed to say plaque. Let me edit this really quick. I definitely, <laughs> um, want to make sure you guys have this right. Black. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a patch greater than one centimeter in flat and then a plaque. Sorry, I clearly was not doing a great job of proofreading. The plaque is raised in greater than one centimeter. So macule goes with patch, papule goes with plaque, and this will be summarized in a table in a couple of slides as well. Um, next, we have the fluid-filled lesions. So a vesicle is fluid-filled and less than one centimeter. Um, so often vesicles um, are caused by herpes simplex virus, and they form these little groups of vesicles that are kind of all clustered together. Um, bulla, on the other hand, are larger. They're greater than one centimeter. They're also fluid-filled with clear fluid. Um, and this would be caused by things like a burn and then some um, like congenital or acquired skin um, diseases can cause bulla just um, an accumulation of fluid in the skin without like a trigger. Um, wanted to add that if a pustule or if the fluid is purulent or has pus in it, like in um, like an acne or something similar, then it's called a pustule and the vesicle is clear fluid. And then lastly is the nodule. Um, this is going to be a greater than one centimeter lesion that involves all three skin layers. So an example of this would be like a cyst. It can be like a tumor, like a nodular melanoma. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this diagnosis is in this picture, but you can see that it's like certainly very large and it probably goes deep and it is just quite extensive. So in summary of the primary skin lesions, if we break it down between less than one centimeter and greater than one centimeter, if it's flat and small, it's a macule. If it's flat and big, it's a patch. If it's raised and small, it's a papule. If it's raised and big, it's a plaque. So like in our patient, with plaque psoriasis, she has a large, like greater than one centimeter um, lesion and it's raised because it has that like overlying scale and you could feel the texture of it on exam. So that would be a plaque. Um, if it's small and fluid filled with clear fluid, it's a vesicle. If it's large and cleared and filled with clear fluid, it's a bulla. And if it's small and pus filled, it's a pustule. And if it's large and it has all three skin layers, it's a nodule. So as a heads up, there's a couple of questions on the quiz for this. Um, if you guys need to go back to any of these pictures or this table, just let me know. I don't think I had a picture of pustule, but I can show you um, really quick if I just like find um, 
picture here. Like this is a good example. So it's going to have this like white, yellowy looking, gross, gunky fluid on the inside rather than like that clear or transparent fluid that was in the vesicle. Does that help? Or like, here's another good one. Like you can see it's, it's not transparent and it's definitely like got this white pus gross stuff in it. And that's why I hate derm <laughs> because I think that stuff is gross. Great question. Thank you for reminding me to show you a picture. Okay. So now to get into the pathology of psoriasis. Um, so psoriasis is an autoimmune condition where inflammatory cells enter the epidermis and infiltrate those keratinocytes like I talked about before, and then they also enter the dermis. So for some epidemiology, um, psoriasis is most commonly diagnosed in the uh, age group of 20 to 40 years old, and it affects about 3% of the U.S. population. So it's not like super rare if you think about like three out of 100 people will have some form of psoriasis. Um, like most autoimmune diseases, um, it associates with, like, if you have one autoimmune disease, you're higher risk for other autoimmune diseases. And that's true for like any, any way or any direction from autoimmune diseases. Um, so if we remember like this patient had hypothyroidism and she had a family history of type one diabetes in her sister. So she's high risk for other autoimmune diseases just by virtue of having a history of it. Um, and then the other thing is that psoriasis can also present with systemic symptoms. So even though we think of it as only affecting the skin, you can have psoriatic arthritis, um, which our patient may have because she had some joint aches and pains alongside of her skin findings. Um, and that can kind of present similar to like a rheumatoid arthritis or like an inflammatory arthritis. And then they also are very highly associated with IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. So that um, umbrellas over ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So you can have GI involvement and have like diarrhea or bloody stools or at, like cramping, and it can be really debilitating. So in a patient with psoriasis, it's really important to screen them for systemic involvement. Um, the triggers for psoriasis are not entirely known, um, but it's hypothesized that stress or skin injury. So like if you maybe have like a bug bite and are scratching really like a lot at your skin, um, that that can like cause that inflammation and um, autoimmune activity in the skin um, that triggers the, re the rash, um, medications, infection, anything that has like physiologic stress can also set this off. So it's kind of multifactorial. Um, there's also, like we said, kind of a genetic component to it with your history and your family history, um, but we don't entirely know exactly why. So this is the result of our biopsy that we took earlier. And it's not like the best quality image, but I think you guys, like if you remember the picture that I showed earlier, um, can kind of compare it. So number one, like all of these tiny dark purple circular cells that the arrows are pointing to here. Like you can see them in this cluster. They're down here. They're right here. They're kind of up into the epidermis as well. Like you can just see them kind of all spread out. Those are all inflammatory cells like lymphocytes, um, which are T cells and B cells and um, are releasing a bunch of like pro-inflammatory mediators that cause inflammation. So we see that inflammation in the skin. Um, and we also are seeing up here, this really, really thick keratin layer that's kind of separated from the rest of the skin that might be like artifact from the biopsy process. But also I think it's good to illustrate that like there's this hyperkeratosis, this like increased layer of the, ker the keratin um, that can cause that extra skin peeling and um, like that so overlying scale. So to go through the treatment options for psoriasis, the first line for many, many skin conditions is topical steroids. Um, that's true for like a lot of contact or allergic dermatitis, for atopic dermatitis and eczema, for psoriasis, for like anything that you have inflammation or irritation of the skin, the dermatologist is probably going to give you a, a topical corticosteroid. So the options for that are 
hydrocortisone, triamcinolone, and clobetazole. Um, there's kind of different strengths of topical steroids depending on the area that you put it on. Um, generally, they want you to avoid putting steroid on really thin areas of the skin. So like um, around like the genitals or around like the head and neck area um, because the, that skin is just more sensitive. Um, and then always we want to focus on symptom management as well and prevention. So encouraging patients to like be really diligent about using emollients. Um, so things like Vaseline, Aquaphor, lotions to just make sure that we're getting a lot of moisture um, because that can help with the itching and it can also um, like just help with the like prevention and, main and, and maintaining the skin barrier. Um, so that's the first line. Um, other options are a topical vitamin D called calcipatriene or a um, another drug called tacrolimus. Tacro, you might have heard, like if you um, know of anybody who's gotten like a organ transplant, it's a it can be used systemically as like an immunosuppressant to prevent rejection. But you can also use it um, just topically to um, like selectively suppress your immune system in the skin. So these are safer to use on thinner areas of the skin. So intertriginous areas would be like the folds. Um, under your armpits, in the groin area, if you have like rolls of skin, like on your stomach or your back, um, those would be places that are not as good to use steroids, but you could use these other drugs. Um, another one that you can do that's really, really helpful and effective is phototherapy. Um, it's basically taking a very specific wavelength of UV light. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's like 300 something nanometers um, that you do for a couple times a week. You have to be really diligent about going to your light therapy. Um, cause it won't work if you just go like every now and then. And the reason why is that UV light is, um, very like immunosuppressive or very, it reduces inflammation, um, of the skin. Um, and if you do it in this controlled way, then it is not like going to a tanning bed and just having like blasted with UV light. Um, but of course, like you have to do it the correct way or else it can increase your risk of skin cancer. Um, those are like the first lines or like the first couple of um, options for the therapies. The last ones that I have listed here are really effective, but they come with a very high like side effect profile. And people just generally like you don't want to give them these drugs unless they really need it if they're like not responding to those first options that we talked about. So the first option is like a systemic non-biologic immunomodulatory drug. So that'd be something like methotrexate. Um, methotrexate's used really commonly in other rheumatologic diseases like, um, like um, sorry, what am I thinking of? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, sometimes lupus, um, just like a lot of autoimmune diseases with systemic involvement, we'll, we'll use methotrexate. And the mechanism of that is that it inhibits folate and DNA synthesis. Um, so basically just like stops extra cell division. Um, and these are certain, like very contraindicated in pregnancy for that reason, because it would mess up the growth of the fetus. Um, you also have like a bunch of side effects and you would then be immunosuppressed um, and more susceptible to getting infections. So another reason why these are not the preferred agents, but they do work well for people who are refractory to those other things. And then lastly, um, we have the systemic biologic drugs. So um, an example of that would be like Humira. You've probably seen commercials on TV for Humira. Um, and it's really good at what it does. So the mechanism for this is it is a monoclonal antibody. That's what this MAB stands for. And there's like a million drugs that end in MAB. And um, it is like a specific antibody for these cytokines. So these TNF alpha, IL-17 and IL-23, you guys don't worry about like the actual letters or like what these do. <laughs> You'll learn about them later down the line. Um, but basically these are just like proteins that signal to the body, like we need inflammation here because we're like under attack. And so this monoclonal antibody will then neutralize these and, and stop the signaling to the body to send more inflammatory cells and inflammatory 
mediators to the skin. And it works really well, but it's extremely expensive. And again, it has side effects and you're immunosuppressed. So you're susceptible to infection, just like you would be with this methotrexate. So for our patient, oh, sorry, but to show you guys, this is kind of the like cellular mechanism of action of these different drugs. So these are the different um, like cell signaling molecules that are going to turn on these inflammatory genes and um, induce the inflammatory response. And so like the corticosteroid, the, this is the calcipotriene, um, or sorry, this is the calcipotriene. Um, and then we didn't talk about the retinoid or the calcineurin inhibitors, but, um, they work in a very similar way. So they're just inhibiting the inflammatory genes producing those molecules. So for our patient, we're going to start her on a topical corticosteroid. She's going to go on triamcinolone and she tries that for three months and some of her psoriasis clears, but it's still there and she's not happy with her results yet. So um, she begins going to weekly UV light phototherapy and that is working really well for her so far. She's able to attend all of her appointments that she needs to and it has a pretty minimal side effect profile and it's working well for her. So yay, she didn't have to go on methotrexate. Okay, so I always like to end these talks with a little spiel about the specialty that we talk about today. So for dermatology, dermatology is very well, very highly sought after by a lot of people. It's pretty competitive because you have regular clinic hours. You've got usually like an eight to four day, um, but you still get a lot of exciting procedures. You get to do things like laser biopsies, um, simple excisions, and then even sometimes like dermatologic surgeries, like Mohs procedures um, and things like that. Uh, derm is a very broad specialty ranging from like aesthetic dermatology and like more plastic surgery type things. Um, which help people with their like self-image and self-esteem to on the other end of the spectrum, like life-saving detection and treatment of cancers. Like skin cancer is the number one cancer of men and women in the U.S. And so it's very prevalent and almost everyone's going to get skin cancer. And dermatologists are very important in the catching or prevention of skin cancer. Um as like a clinic provider and somebody who's, you know, going to see patients like on a regular basis, you can have great relationships and continuity with them um, without being like necessarily their primary care provider who deals with all of their other health problems. And then no, probably not surprising, but like dermatology takes very little if no call and are very well compensated. So <laughs> um yeah, I think they've got it pretty good from what I understand. It may be good for you if you if this sounds like something you'd be interested in. So to become a dermatologist, you need to do four years of medical school, which is like the same for every other medical specialty. Um, and then you do one intern year in like general medicine and then three years of dermatology specific residency. Um, so four total years of training after med school and to become like a dermatologist. And then you can have the option of doing fellowship. Um, options for fellowship that I found are dermatopathology. So if you are really interested in like looking under the microscope at those biopsies and at the histology of what's going on at a like cellular level, then that could be a good fit for you. Pediatric dermatology, if you like working with kids. Mo's micrographic surgery is really cool where they take somebody with usually like skin cancer. Um, and if it's in a difficult area, like on the face or on the scalp or something, um, then you can go in like layer by layer and check the margins under a microscope for if there's still cancer and make sure that you take enough that it's going to be gone, but like at not so much that it's going to be, um, like a, as difficult as a regular excision to close and to heal. So Mo's is very cool. Um, also they, I think are like the highest paid doctors like that exist. <laughs> and then cosmetic dermatology or like laser, I think is another fellowship that I heard about, but I didn't really see much online. Um, 
personally, it's not really my thing. So I'm not super well versed on this stuff, but uh, it's certainly out there if you are interested in learning more about it. So those are my sources for this. Um, next for you guys, if, if you want to start working on that quiz, I know we finished a little bit early, so please feel free to let me know if you have any questions or want to go back to any of the slides. Um, you can start working on the quiz and if you come across a question that you're like, I don't know, we can go through it together. Um, and if not, then please leave feedback at the end of this of the Google form. I really I read like everybody's comments and suggestions for future topics and i really appreciate the ideas that you guys give me so thank you so much for joining i had a great night talking with you guys and i hope that you learned something about dermatology any questions so far oh my gosh thank you so much for asking about this is it isa or is a or Isa, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly, but um, she was asking, are the different skin conditions presented differently in people with darker skin tones? And that is a very excellent question. Um, so unfortunately, um, in medical education in general, but especially in dermatology, there is a severe lack of representation of different skin tones. Um, and the way that different skin conditions present there. They do certainly look different and it's very hard to like find examples in literature of those conditions. I'm gonna put, um, if I can find it really quick on my phone, there's an awesome Instagram account. Um, I'm gonna link it on the in the chat in case you guys wanna um, look it up. It's called Brown Skin Matters. And um, it shows like differences in, I don't know if you guys are able to like see this, but like this is an example of shingles in a patient with darker skin and versus a patient with lighter skin. And it's just trying to increase the representation of different skin tones in dermatology. Um, so yes, you're correct that there is certainly differences. Um, but the general definitions of like macule papule, vesicle bulla, those are the same regardless of skin tone. Um, and it has a lot of the same features like psoriasis would have that same sort of overlying silver scale. Um, the same quality to the rash would be there. It just generally dark skin doesn't have as much of that redness to it. Um, it has more either hypo or hyper pigmentation. Um, and that's simply because like the melanin covers up a lot of the redness from the inflammation. So thank you for asking that. I now I'm like regretting not including more of that in this presentation. Um, but I think that this account and some of the other projects that are going on out there do an awesome job of trying to increase that representation and show examples for people to like know what to look out for. Yes, thank you for asking. I hope that was like a good answer. I I just like, yeah, this is, I even wrote in my, cause I told you guys, I just did my dermatology rotation and I wrote like an angry um, feedback about how they didn't really address differences in like any capacity <laughs> on a dermatology rotation, which is like, what the heck? This is arguably the most important time to be able to know about the different skin differences. But um, so now that like, I, <laughs> I think my brain is just not really working all the way because I'm in the middle of applications and stuff. And I just wrote this case yesterday, but you're absolutely correct that we should be paying more attention to it. <laughs>